where you start filming. Uh, so some of the worst scallywags in that court are Catholic. The worst. They're all, you know, Scalia. It's, uh, he's monstrous. He's mean-spirited. Thomas is Catholic. And then Alito and Roberts. I can't believe it. That Oh, thank you very much. By the way, I left you that black book. Oh, you have my. You can have that. Thank you. You're thank you. Yeah, they, they, they were great days for the court. And Nuremberg, too. Yeah. It is uh, part of what I've uh, <clears throat> noted in this uh, opportunity to, to just to get to meet you is Dietrich Bonhoeffer's role and Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life story just intersects an awful lot with the Nazis, the Nazi leadership, the perpetrators yeah. of the Holocaust, perpetrators of uh, much of the crimes against humanity, and that's where, frankly, the intersect yeah. occurs yeah. with Jackson being the chief prosecutor yeah. at the Nuremberg trial. Right. And uh, did you find that, is your, well, first of all, I, I don't know if you got into it, but what drew you to Bonhoeffer? Of all people. Well, what happened, uh, <clears throat> let me, I better take a swig of water in that. Um, I'd mention him. See, it's hard for me to describe religious life. I belonged to the De La Salle Christian Brothers for some 20 years of my life. Now, it's hard when you say uh, I was a religious order, it doesn't ring any bells. Like one of my uh, fellow brothers was Pete, the actor Pete Boyle. This is not on camera, but anyway. Um, and uh, when Pete died, he was a good friend, you know, and a great actor. Oh, God, he was funny. Oh, he was fun to live with, and, and he would get me in trouble. See, he has a high-pitched voice singing. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So we had three tenors back there, myself. Now, I'm losing my voice now, so I'm not going to give you any, uh, <laughs> ha, 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 you know. So, but anyway, he, uh, and, and Hillary O'Connor, yeah. and Pete Boyle between us, you know, it's fairly... Big, but he had a high-pitched voice singing now. Not, he could, his voice, sing, speaking voice, could be anybody's voice. He'll listen to you for five minutes. <laughs> you could go out of the room, and Pete would sit there, and he'd be Greg. You know, your voice would, he wouldn't ask the same questions. <clears throat> I remember one time we were singing a very high note, and you know the choir director's directing us and all that, and and then Pete's, and we hit the high G, Hillary and myself, and Pete's squeaking up there. And you know, he's, they look at him and he says, hey, Kel, were your bulls ever going to drop? And I say, no, well, I start laughing. And the choir director stops. And you think this is funny, don't you, Brother Kelly? <laughs> so, thanks, it. Pete. You got me in trouble. God darn you. <laughs> he was like that, though. Yeah, yeah. He was good. He could, uh, oh, he could imitate voices. I, I have other stories of Pete Boyle, but I, you know, to save them. It's, uh, when, he left the, when he left the brothers, he kind of disappeared. He, he went and, um, he joined the, uh, he wanted to be a naval officer. Mm -hmm. He had these dreams, you know, they're pipe dreams. He wanted to be this, he wanted to be that. So, he, uh, you know, he was a good brother, but, uh, and a good student. But, you know, uh, not, not when it would settle down. So, okay, so he, he joined the, na the Naval uh, Officer's Training Corps in the Navy. Right. See, his father was the famous Chuck Wagon Pete that was on television. And, um, I was in charge of the school newspaper at Calvert Hall while I was getting my, studying for a doctorate at Johns Hopkins University. So the reward for the newspaper writers and editors that we get a trip to New York, the director would give extra money, I'd stay in a hotel, take them to shows and a big dinner at Mama Leone's. And afterwards I was walking down the Broadway with uh, myself and my two main editors, uh, Tom Loom and uh, Lowe, Charles Lowe, Charles Lowe and Tom Loom. Walking down the street, and uh, this guy all over in a shabby overcoat with a long beard comes right up to me and grabs me like this. Oh, Christ, I'm going to get mugged. And shakes me like that. And these two editors, like later I said, you guys are chicken shit. You know, they ran off. And I said, would you want to get a coffee? And they said, no, no, we were just scared. I said, thanks, just leave me in the hands of this monster. It was Pete. Okay. He had this, brother, we, my name was Brother Benil then. It's my middle name now. Brother Benil, don't you recognize me? I said, oh, Pete, for God's sake. I said, you almost gave me a heart attack. And he looked so shabby. Yeah, yeah. I said, oh, Pete. So we hugged, and uh, but that was a, you know, I said, you really scared me. I said, what's up? He said, well, 
He says, you know, I've been drifting. He says, I'm acting down in Central Park. I'm acting in Shakespeare. He says, I, I don't get paid. I'm just being noticed. And I got an interview with TWA. They want me to do advertising. I said, wow. I said, see, that's, maybe you'll break it. He says, I said, look, I had a couple hundred dollars. In there. Look, Pete, you need some money. Here, look, a couple hundred. He said, no, 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 I don't need, my dad sends me money. And uh, I said, oh, geez, you sure I can't, uh, they, they did any food, anything? He says, no, he says, you're, it's cow. He says, you're it's the same old mother. So he said, uh, he says, look, if, if I get notice, I may make it big. I said, oh, okay, so, well, Pete, it's so nice to see you. I'm just sorry that you're still searching. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we still remember the old, old time, you know, so. Uh, but that was always Brother Benilde to him. So when he came back to La Salle to get an honorary doctorate and was giving a talk to the students, he talked about his friendship with Brother Benilde. They didn't know who I was. <laughs> I've always been Jeff ever since then. So everyone's looking around, who's this Brother Benilde? <laughs> Afterwards, I told Pete, I said, thanks. I said, you want to single me out? They don't know who I am. He says, you always had an identity crisis, Jeff. <laughs> so, anyhow, so uh, then I, was, I, got over, I got over to Europe and I'm up reading Time magazine. And there's a movie section, this film named Joe, and this new star, Peter Boyle. He said, oh my God, he made it. He, had, he was picked up, the, noticed doing a TWA commercial, yeah. and made the big time. <laughs> so, what a great story. Brother, but they couldn't, uh, see, they, when they wrote up his uh, necological notice, they couldn't get religious life out. They just called, he was a, mon in a, a monk in a monastery. Yeah. So, that we, we called ourselves monks, but we really, it yeah. wasn't a monastery. But I, I, I can't explain it any other way, yeah. so I was in a monastery. Anyway, so I was in the monastery, and they had pulled me out of doctoral studies at Johns Hopkins. And I was really crushed by it, uh, you know, because I had one year to go, and I was destined to be a language teacher at LaSalle College, at least I thought. But I had my master's degree in religious studies from LaSalle College, and they made me a director of postulants, you know, the, and subdirector of novices at the Mother House of Formation, where these young kids are coming in at age 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and, uh, and I would be their spiritual director. And uh, as a spiritual director, I had to meet every one of them. We, we had 40 of them. At one summer, I had to meet every one of them, see, and getting them ready for the novitiate, to take the vows. I take the religious habit, and then after a year of novitiate, then they have to put the robe on and get a, and go out teaching or do. No, they go on to the next phase of formation. So as I was going through the summer and te te teaching these guys how to pray, how to meditate, and I felt dr totally drained. Like uh, life was becoming dull, meaningless, dry, and I felt the, what they used to call the dark night of the soul, getting down and well, I'm not doing any good, and I don't know what's the matter with me. I went to my spiritual director, and he said, well, the problem is you, you need a good spiritual reading book. You know, you know, prime the bump, you know, get the batteries charged. Yeah. He said, what are you reading now? I said, Duran says, this is, you know, big fat volume has put you to sleep. The only thing good about it would put me to sleep. So, so he said, oh, put that away. He says, yeah, go out to the library and get a good book. So I went out to the library, a brand new book just arrived, The Cost of Discipleship. So I looked, I said, well, I pulled it off the shelf, and I opened book to the, I always open books in the middle to see, yeah. get the flavor of it, then you know, jump around like that. This is the right way to, wrong way to do it. So and I opened the book. We have gathered like ravens around the carcass of cheap grace. There we have drunk of the poison that has killed the life of following Jesus among us. Wow, I said, that's me. That's what's wrong with me. There's no, Jesus isn't in my life anymore. I'm just going through the road. The, you know, get up in the morning, you follow the rule, one exercise after another. You, Eat your time at a regular time, eat our time to pray, go to bed at night, get up in the morning, go through the same old. I figured, geez, you know, I know what's the matter. Jesus is, I've lost Jesus. So that started me, and I read, I'd have thought it was written 1964. Mm -hmm. It was 19, I didn't know. I went to the front of the book and said, oh my God. It was translated from the German, 1937. And holy, then there's his brother-in-law, the Gerhard Leipholz, who be able to smuggle out of Germany. I never got to that in the talk. But, uh, uh, you know, Jewish in, by uh, origins, but Christian by baptism. He wrote the memoir telling about the life of Bonhoeffer. I thought, wow, this guy is interesting. So that's how it's, that's how I began to read everything I could find on him. The Ethics was the next volume. 
Then they sent me to Europe to get a, a doctorate in theology. Uh, first of all, I, I did Lumen Vitae. See, that was International Catechetical Institute. And that was, I, wanted to, I didn't want to stay as director of postulants because it's, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel adequate to be that kind of a spiritual guru to so all these young kids. I mean, I did it, they, they liked me. Uh, so then I met this nun at the Catholic University and she had just come back from Lumen Vitae and she, I said, yeah, that's great. I, what, what's it like over there? So she said, yeah, well, you know, we spoke French all the time. I said, wow, you speak French? And I was just close to a doctorate in French literature. So I began speaking in French with her and she, she, could, she says, God, you speak French fluently. I said, well, you know, uh, yeah, he said, that's okay. She said, you ought to do Lumen Vitae. I'm thinking, click, there's my ticket out of here. <laughs> you know, so I put in, they take 120 students from around the world, 10 of Americans, 10 Americans, no more. So I put in for Lumen Vitae and got it, one of the 10. And I guess maybe my degrees, I don't know what it was. And then I had to write to the provincial superior and said, look, I got this great opportunity. Uh, I could maybe uh, parlay that and go back to Catholic U and get my doctorate in theology for two more years. I said, fine, go to it. So I said goodbye to my postulants. The last class, they, they had their reunion again, and they brought me, they, I was just out, I just had surgery. Yeah. I had a tube sticking out of my dick, you know. And they said, you've got to come to our reunion. So I said, yeah, my last class. So I went, I had the tube taken out, though, <laughs> thank God. And uh, we had a wonderful time. But, so I went to, uh, then I went to uh, Lumen Vitae, and then <clears throat> I got a letter while I was at Lumen Vitae, because a lot of the teachers at Lumen Vitae were also teachers at Louvain, and I had a close buddy from the California province of Christian Brothers who was getting his doctorate in philosophy at Louvain, and we used to get together, and I would sit in a couple of courses there, and I really got to like Louvain. I thought, uh, I got a letter, I was gonna write a letter to the provincial superior saying, look, uh, if you want me to get a doctorate in theology, I think I can manage to uh, study at uh, Louvain. I said, I have some of my same teachers. I never finished the letter. Their letter came over and said, we'd like you to get a doctorate in theology. Would you investigate places in Europe? And we'll send you to, uh, what type of places would you think? I'm thinking, oh, geez. And they're going to pay my way. So there's Strasbourg, Paris, Rome. Yeah. Paris, Strasbourg. In Rome, they were the three, I mean, I'd go down to there, Strasbourg, Paris, and Rome. What else? Did, I guess they were the main three. So I, instead of paying my way, I went down to Strasbourg. I, I met uh, Nadal Sell and Chenu. You know, we had a great time there. But no, and it didn't, you know, it wasn't Louvain. Went down to Rome, and the brothers were there, and they said, Jeff, don't come here. This is awful. So they're in the shadow of the Vatican. They're strict, and it's all conservative shit. It says, don't come here. So I think, Rome's off the list. I go to Paris. Two of my close buddies and the brothers partying like crazy. So they want to, oh, you got to come here. It's party, party. Every night, you know, we have Paris, you know. They put me in the room for this uh, Holy Cross priest who had been there working seven years on his doctorate in on organization in the church. His room was a, ba a wastebasket. An organization that he hadn't done a damn thing on it. They finally do Holy Cross province a couple years later. They, ordered them back to the States, you know. So I, but I, I, you know, they begged me to stay in Paris because I would be a third man and we'd be able to party almost every night. I, I said, no, I want to study. They said, you're crazy. Why would you go to Louvain? I said, I want to get my doctorate. I want to study. And so, of course, Paris off the list with reluctance. <laughs> and then uh, I wrote, and I've, I've investigated all four and Louvain looks like the best one. So I got, they said, fine, get your doctorate at Louvain. That's how I got it. Now, in Louvain, I had Lumen Vitae behind me. I had a master's from La Salle. And uh, by your second year, you have to declare what your doctoral dissertation is going to be all about, because your licentiate thesis has to be a slice of that dissertation. So uh, I thought, well, wouldn't it be neat if I could write on Bonhoeffer? So I, uh, there was a Franciscan priest, Christian Orovec, who's uh, St. Francis Loretto now, pre he was president there. I think he still is president. And he did his dissertation on Bonhoeffer's ecclesiology. So we got to be talking and I said, you know, I like to write on Bonhoeffer. I said, uh, and I'm interested in Revelation theology because I had written already articles on Revelation. He said, well, that looks like it's wide open. Why don't you put in for it? So I did and they accepted it. So my dissertation was Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's theology of Revelation. 
later it became Revelation in Christ, the theology of Revelation Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And that's got me lost. That's how it, that's the long story. Well, that's a fascinating story. What did you find, obviously you went through the literature at the time, what did you see that had not been covered? I mean, a lot had been written about Bonhoeffer. Yeah. It's not like an unknown subject, but at some point when you decided on the subject matter, what did you feel that had, there was a, a void or a vacuum that you needed to fill? Yeah, I think part of it was, is there's first of all a negative reaction that uh, in the Catholic Church, in which I was reared, they had they would speak of a deposit of revelation. It's something that looks like it's it's in a box, or that there has been no revelation since the death of the apostle John, because he was alive during the days of after the before the ascension, so he got all that material hooked up. To, I'm thinking that's not revelation, especially Bonhoeffer's book on uh, act and being, you know that, uh, which is a book about revelation. And uh, like Revelation, it, it can take on many different forms, the way God speaks to us. First of all, how do I know it's God? And then secondly, is it uh, an act that it really hits me once, and that conditions the rest of my life? Or is it being something that uh, stays with me for the rest of my life, and constantly uh, nourishing me and re rehabbing me uh, in what God has originally said to me, so that God Progressively, God is revealing more of who God is, and revealing to me more of who I am in the eyes of God. So, being. Well, Bonhoeffer had both of them. See, so, and I use that example that uh, uh, God encounters uh, Moses at the burning bush. Well, you know, that changed Moses' life. That's an act. But, they, to, but in order to, to know, to know that, that it is God, God has to make sure that he knows it's the Father, uh, God the Father of Abraham and you know, Isaac and Job. So the whole, he has to put Moses in a perspective, the per perspective of the community of the Jewish people. So that Revelation has that both aspects to it. It's the way that God interrupts our lives and can change us for the better for the rest of our life, and the way that God remains in continuity with us in, co in a community that, in which we can find and, and nourish the Jesus Christ that's getting expression through us. <clears throat> so that, that really was... Uh, I mean, in the dissertation, that's what I found to be very uh, important to ex explain. Mm -hmm. You know, the, how revelation comes to be, and using Bonhoeffer's writings with some embellishment, and then to talk about uh, <clears throat> some of the aspects that uh, uh, are connected to a theology of revelation. How much is revelation associated with uh, statements or definitions? See that. Uh, you can you you circumscribe revelation so that it becomes very static, you know, a catechism, for example, or a uh, series of dogmatic utterances. See, so I wanted to do battle with that through using Bonhoeffer's theology, which is very dynamic, you know, the searching for what God would have him do and what would have him be in the period of the uh, of his growth, in uh, as a pastor, and and also as a teacher. You know, I began to see some of the writings that uh, connected to when he, when he taught catechism, for example. He wrote a catechism. You know, so it's so different, you know, that, and his statements when he taught this uh, in the slums of Berlin, I don't think I got to that in today's presentation. Mm -hmm. Would have been so much, so much more to say. Yeah. Not only was he an esteemed theologian, you know, theologians in Germany, I mean, they're the hot shit, you know, they, they, <laughs> oh. God, I remember being with uh, Hans Fife, Hans File. Uh, no, let's see, yeah, File, Ernst File, Ernst File, and he visited us. He, you know, he visits me whenever he comes to the states, yeah. and we're talking about uh, uh, his schedule and my schedule. My schedule, you teach four courses, and there's no assistant given me. You know, I'm, I am who I am, and I have a secretary for the nine different people in the department. Ernst teaches two courses. He has two graduate assistants that do all the work grading, all the other work. And he gets a sabbatical every uh, so many years. So he's, uh, I'm telling him what my schedule is. And Ernst just takes this oh, on Vierklagen. And we, and we complain. <laughs> so, but that's, uh, you know, the, you know, the uh, Bonhoeffer's 
writings on Revelation, which are the key of my dis doctoral dissertation, uh, I think they're very electrifying because they're, they're dynamic. Could you and he asked the tough questions, too. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of tough questions, the one that seemingly always comes up, but maybe you can help me trace this. Here's a guy of principally a pacifist, and through a sense yeah. of metamorphosis. He, he has pacifist leanings. And then all of a sudden yeah. he finds himself in the abware and, and all that conspiratorial, which you talked about. But uh, I get a sense that there's a lot more to that story yeah. of. Uh, well, I could start. He never loses the peace ethic. In other words, the ideal, which has to be striven for, is uh, peace on earth, and uh, and war is as as of evil. I mean, the quotations against war, you you'll never find anything like that. Now, even from Gandhi, in all the writings of the 1930s, he's the leading ex exponent of of a, of the statements or inspiring statements against war. I mean, you can't find anything that outdoes Bonhoeffer in that, and he's strong on it. And these are sermons, and they're courageous sermons. See, I mean, even to the, all those assembled people in the World Alliance of Churches, I mean, all these guys you know, from all around the world, that if you want to be a real church, he says, this is your mission. You, know? you can stop war. You can forbid war. So, I mean, he's very, uh, <laughs> that's ch he's challenging. Yeah. See? And uh, then, you know, the statements that, um, <clears throat> see, th that the church of today can be the false church of tomorrow, you know, that kind of blows the whistle on the, on the for, for me anyway, for the Catholic Church is thinking that it's a stranglehold on revelation and dogmatic truth. It's infallible, you know. That you don't find that in Bonhoeffer. You, you have responsibility. In your research, how deep was he into the conspiracy? for the assassination of Hitler. Oh, very much so. He was the moral backbone. Yeah. See, I never got to that 14-page letter. I wanted to read that if we had another half an hour. Uh, I have a copy of it. In fact, I copied it out of the, uh, the new translation. It's, I think it's the most dramatic statement of why the conspirators had to act. And also, there's some beautiful statements in there. Like, we're not Christ. But if we want to be Christian, we have to act when the hour of danger comes. And then we, for the first time in history, we've learned to see the events from below, from the, uh, the, the, cons you know, the perspective of the, the people that are the, the victims, the suffering, and so on. Did you get a sense that it was really his brother-in-law that was driving him into this, or was it a, a collective? No, no, I think the brother-in-law and the brother were interested in, uh, well, there are two things uh, to, to them. They wanted to save him from being arrested, because he, well, he did say he would not serve in the military of Germany. So they, they figured out the best way to save him was to include him as a, as a double agent. We could, and we got good reasons for that. He's got ecumenical contacts, and they're going to be useful. So the papers, the original recruitment papers were, he, he's very useful for, through his ecumenical contacts, because then he can tell us who would be very favorable to the German occupation when we conquer England or conquer Czech, whatever, whatever we do, you know. He's got all these ecumenical contacts which we can exploit. Well, that was, that was what they stated, so that the, they say the uh, Gestapo was always suspicious of the Abwehr. Himmler always wanted to control everything. Hitler was a, I mean, Himmler was as much of a monster as Hitler himself. And uh, so they, they the, when they finally were able to arrests the main conspirators, and that included Bonhoeffer, von Donagny, Canaris. Uh, that, that really, that, that Gestapo was, now is our chance. Now we control everything. Even Hitler saw through that. He was very suspicious of Himmler's grab for power. And even when they, um, the assassination attempt, they, uh, some of them were postponed because they couldn't get all the villains in the same area at the time. Instead of just commissioning somebody with a pistol or something to get his way in and shoot the guy. I mean, I think Larry Rasmussen said it very well. The conspiracy was a moral victory but a technical failure. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, but he, uh, he was useful. Then, then they could use him for events. They knew that Germany was going to lose the war because they're going to make sure. 
So you, you saw the, uh, I think I tried to talk about how Franco was, uh, can you imagine, the, to, a, able to steel himself against the blandishments of Adolf Hitler and all that, you know, the way, <laughs> can you imagine the troops marching through Spain? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they had, actually, some of those that did serve in Spain, to, again, the Civil War, I met a couple of those in, the, in workshops I had gone to, <clears throat> and they said they were proud. They said, we were liberators. Same for the same troops that went into the Ukraine. And some of them would be tears in their eyes. They said, we were greeted as liberators, and look what happened. Then they say some, those damn SS people, they came in and ruined everything. They, they, they turned the people against us. We had the people throwing flowers at us. So, and in Spain, we were heroes. We liberated them from communism. And now look, they say, now look. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of frustration. They, I mean, these are good Germans who, uh, uh, I mean, they spent the war years in the army and they, they realized that <coughs> they were betrayed by their own leaders. So, um, but no, he was, um, then they, the second phase was they realized they could use him in order to undermine, uh, they could send him on missions. In particular, they knew that the war was going to be lost once Hitler invaded Russia. The Abwehr knew that. And they were also revealing Hitler's uh, tactics. I mean, in the, even in the documentary on uh, Bonhoeffer, no, it's a documentary on, no, it's on the restless conscience. Uh, the, one of the um, leaders in Holland said, we, we knew what, the, what was coming. We didn't believe him. They told us everything, but we didn't believe it. So they were revealing the plans to invade Holland. Right. And they couldn't, they thought it was, you know, this double dealing tricks of the, Abwehr, uh, but it's true that they were undermining the German war effort, the Abwehr. And they, they leaked the plans, and sometimes the Russians would take it seriously, and sometimes they didn't. The Allies, they, they knew everything. The plan, I mean, the, and of course, the big thing, though, the, uh, uh, the, well, the smuggling Jews out of Germany, though, that was a major operation, and that put them in mortal danger. See, and really, the initial interrogations were all about Operation 7. And that poor Schmidhuber, uh, they tortured him and he, uh, well, the, I, you know, I felt like saying those damn Swiss, you know, they, they wouldn't let them in because their argument was, well, the Jews aren't going to get work, so you better give us a lot of foreign currency. And uh, the Swiss, uh, I mean, they don't come across as uh, very benign in Operation 7. And then, and then, of course, you had to get the foreign currency to them, and that's when okay. Schmidt Hoover got arrested, and then the name of Bonhoeffer comes up, and Mueller. Joseph Mueller, oh, you would have loved to interview him. He's a lawyer. Now, you're a lawyer. Yeah. Oh, God. I interviewed him. He's twice your size. Mm -hmm. They had called him the ox, and he was a marvelous specimen of human power. Yeah. We met over, we had a table between us. And he was sweating like crazy, oh. But he was courageous. His mission, he knew Bonhoeffer very well. They shared uh, missions together. Okay. Bonhoeffer would go up to Sigtuna to negotiate terms of surrender. He went to the Vatican. Joseph Mueller of the Vatican knew him and loved him. So he would meet with the Allies in uh, the Vatican. But Schmidt Huber got his name in the Gestapo, so he got arrested. You know, he said, he says, why did the Swiss have to have all that GD money? Yeah, yeah. He said, and Schmidt Huber, he says, of all the people they send for this, this guy was a klutz. They sent him to negotiate. The, so that's how we, I got arrested, he said. And then uh, they sent me to the Flossenburg concentration camp, where Bonhoeffer was executed. He said he knew Bonhoeffer very well. He said, it's sad that he didn't survive. He said, you, you, you know, some of the finest Germans, or some, some of the finest human beings you ever want to meet were murdered by uh, Hitler in the aftermath. But he said, uh, <clears throat> I was supposed to be executed. He says, I, the Hitler gave the order that anybody connected to the conspiracy was supposed to be executed. And he said, uh, well, now he says, he's telling me this, you know, he's a huge man, you know, with Joe Ox, you know, I could see that. He says, they dragged me out of my cell. They, told me, they stripped me naked. They tied my hands behind my back and pushed me towards the gallows. He says, and he says, you know, he called me Chuff. They can't say Jeffrey very well. Chuff, what would you do? I said, I'd, I'd shit myself. <laughs> he said, yes, that's what I wanted to do. He said, no, seriously. 
He said, I was a lawyer. He couldn't, he's raising his hand now, he couldn't do it then. I was a lawyer and I have a voice. I know that you have to have read the sentence of death. And he said, where are the papers? Where was the court martial? It was not court martial. Court martial. He was found. Uh, he was found not guilty. And then they rearrested him because you know the Gestapo. They he was found guilty by a court. Then they rearrested him and sent him down to Flossenburg to be executed. The orders. Uh, where are the papers? Well, I demand to see the papers. Now he's with his hands behind his back. You know, with the gesturing with his feet and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I demand to see the papers. I, you, if you are to execute me, then I want to see the result of the court. I was not court-martialed. There's no verdict. Where are the papers? You were supposed to read the sentence of death to me. Where is it? And they, they all, these are, these are not educated people. You know, they're doing the dirty work. So they, they sent for the commandant. The commandant is adjusting his pants, asking me what's telling me. He's coming down. Why well, He says, the papers are on their way. He says, all right, you'll prove your point. He says, now tomorrow we're going to hang you. He says, and I'll make sure you're dead. Now, go, take him back to his cell. He never, they never followed up. Wow. The papers never came. <laughs> and he was liberated. He was in that uh, transport. You know, Himmler had negotiated terms of surrender. Um, if they could, uh, he would give them important prisoners. You know, he's just cleaning house in Flossenburg. Nemo was one of them. He would give the uh, Allies important prisoners in exchange for safe passage into Switzerland. So the bus load was loaded with these, some of these important prisoners. Mueller was one of them. Yeah. And uh, the orders were, if it goes through, that the SS on the bus were to machine gun the prisoners, execute all of them. And he said, he told the Allies that. Okay, so here he goes off towards, he gets captured and he commits suicide. But uh, the Italian partisans, see, Flossenburg is very, that section, you know, you're very close to the Tyrol, yeah. see? And so a safe place to transport would be into the Italian Tyrol, okay? So, uh, but the Italian partisans, they uh, ambushed the bus, pulled the SS off and killed the SS people and they were free, yeah. just like that. Unbelievable. Imagine coming that close. Yeah. As a lawyer, you might be able to do it. I, I'd be shitting uh, myself. <laughs> so. I'd be right there. <laughs> and it just, uh, the, I find it just the irony of how he, Bonhoeffer, and his brother-in-law were actually caught because of the way you described it, yeah. really through not what you would have thought. This is dumb things. They tried to hide things while the Gestapo were there. And uh, it was between Oster and <coughs> Van Donanyi. There was a bit of a piece of paper that had some incriminating evidence. And the Gestapo saw them pass it to be uh, destroyed and they, they got it. And so that, you know, then they arrested them. And then the interrogations began. They knew that uh, they couldn't prove, uh, they didn't have the absolute proof. They just knew that they were involved. So that you have a Bonhoeffer using all the wiles you know, as a naive professor in over his head, you know, playing the role. And uh, Van Donani uh, also saying, you know, he was a loyal servant. He was running the agency. The Operation 7 was really to counter all this vicious anti government propaganda. You know, so they, they put on a good face. And, uh, but the Gestapo knew they were lying through their teeth. Yeah. See? And they, they kept digging and digging. And finally, <clears throat> they found the Zosen papers. Now, the, the Zosen papers were records that the Abwehr kept. Uh, I think earlier, Canaris had said to Donyani, destroy them. But they didn't, he didn't destroy them. You know why they didn't destroy them? Well, remember, after the war, Nazis, anybody connected with Nazi Germany was arrested, put on trial. Mm -hmm. Nuremberg might be one. Yeah. Do you think Canaris might be, would have been one of those, the head of the military intelligence? Mm -hmm. So they wanted to prove, they had proof, documentary proof, that they were actually working against Nazi Germany. This was their ticket free after the war. Yeah. But the Gestapo had, that was, that was the incriminating. And that really, all those who were hanged on the same day as Bonhoeffer, uh, Gera, Zak, Donani, not Donani, he, he was executed. They had to carry him to the gallows. Uh, Oster and the Canaris. And uh, they were, and of course Bonhoeffer, they, there were seven of them executed. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And then, of course, Fondonani, uh, because he, he felt he wouldn't be, survive the uh, interrogations, he had his wife uh, infect him with diphtheria germans, germs so that he could uh, be too ill to uh, be interrogated. And he wouldn't, therefore, under torture, he wouldn't be able to reveal all, the, all that he knew. But they had the papers, see? Sure. And uh, they, they carried him on a stretcher to the gallows to kill him. Uh, and then they said, I know some one documentary had them being hanged with piano wire. That happened to the generals in Berlin. Berlin yeah. And that was filmed, but not in, not in Flossenburg. Yeah. They wanted to get that over with and get drunk. That was. The, the actual interrogations, was, uh, was Freisler involved in those interrogations? No. Manfred Ruder. Let me get the book for you, uh, so you might be able to, I'm leaving tomorrow, but you man, Freisler was really uh, monstrous in his uh, acting as a, the uh, head judge in these trials, because he does, did something in Germany which would never be allowed in the United States or in most civilized countries. He would take time out to insult the prisoners and, 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 and try to make them feel uh, tra tra traitorous, you know, and, uh, calling them like a filthy louse, and I mean, are you, and you know, it was a terrible ordeal for those that faced Freisler. The one that simply, that seemed to hold his own was uh, Count Helmut James von Moltke. See, mm -hmm. it's a fascinating person, and a, and a colleague of Bonhoeffer. He, he was the one that went with Bonhoeffer to Norway, ostensibly to calm things down for the German occupation, but in reality to tell the Norwegian church, the bishops there, Keep it up. <laughs> Tell the world, make Norway an example to the world of the evils of the Nazi occupation. Just out of curiosity, did Bonhoeffer and the head of the Nazi German church, Mueller, ever connect? Ludwig Mueller. He despised Mueller. Did he? Yeah. But did they ever talk? I mean, did, you, did you have any indication that they. Except through intermediaries. No. Uh, he he, he uh, mobilized against Mueller. He tried to get him uh, not elected to be the Nazi, to be the uh, head bishop. Hitler's master plan was to have a united church under Ludwig Mueller, and of course united government under Adolf Hitler. And uh, of course Bonhoeffer worked uh, with. The, they called themselves young reformers. They worked uh, the church elections, but it was useless because the the elections were rigged, and. Uh, uh, but uh, to intermediaries, those that were supporters of uh, Living Mueller would uh, write letters uh, telling Bonhoeffer, look, uh, if you go to England, you're not allowed to speak against the government. We want you to sign a paper saying you will not speak ill of this German government. He refused to sign it. See? So the, the, you have to look at the, uh, the uh, correspondence with the lesser church leaders. But Mueller even, I mean, he disgusted the Nazis, so he, he was so heavy-handed and so uh, sycophantic that I think even the Nazis realized they made a poor choice. Mm -hmm. and he was not, he had no leadership qualities, except he was a loyal Nazi, so. You've had a chance to talk about, read about, you pretty much, that's become your alter egos. It's, it's a it's a separate it's a it's a career, <laughs> it's a professional career. Uh, I hadn't chosen it. I've tried to branch out every now and then. Uh, the, the book that I was uh, showing Maureen, is there a God in healthcare, toward a new spirituality of medicine that I wrote with a uh, former student, uh, you know, a medical doctor from Princeton, a cardi actually a cardiologist from Princeton. We wrote that together. It started out as. A uh, paper he wrote for me for a summer, so we could get his master's degree. And it, you know, every time I would criticize something, he would get. Uh, uh, I say, I asked, oh, "Why don't you write a, a book on uh, spirituality and medicine?" Okay. Now we, you know, we talked about it, and so he said, "Okay." So he starts writing it, and I'm criticizing what he says. I said, "That's not." I said, "That's not the way you should say it." So I'm putting red ink on his. He went home to his wife and. He said, you know, I, you know, Jeff is, you know, he's, I don't think he's happy with what I'm writing. This is guy, this is the one cardiologist of the year. He's, you know, he's a brilliant guy. So she said, uh, Bill, his wife, Aileen, she said, Bill, go back to Jeff. You tell him this. You write the spirituality, I'll write the medicine, he says. And he came back and he said, Jeff, 
why don't we do this? He says, you, let, let me take care of the medical stuff, and you write about spirituality, and I'll rewrite your stuff, and you can rewrite mine. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, deal. I said, but look, it's, every time we talk, I said, it gets more and more and more and more. Yeah. And I said, you know, it's looking like a book. And he said, yeah. So we, I said, all right, let's do it, chapter by chapter, okay? Now we both have input. You take the first chapter, and I'm going to come in. That's where the book goes. Yeah. You know, the, the, Dr. Bill has his sayings. Theodore, the, theologian Jeff responds. And then there's a chapter on prayer. Then we've decided, let, let's drop the masks, I said. And when it comes to prayer, let's talk about how we learn how to pray. I said, no, no, no funny stuff. I'll tell you my problems. And you tell me, you know, I promise you that. So we've down now. The suffering. I had my daughter near death. So he said, you got to talk about that. I said, ah. Oh. I had a religious experience holding a dead, oh, he's a dying baby yeah. in my arms. And uh, I said, I don't want to talk about it. He says, Jeff, you have to. So he would say, you know, no, Jeff, you got to put it in there. So the book was almost all done when uh, the copy editor, she liked it a lot, she um, phoned me. She said, uh, Jeff, I'd like the book, she said, but there's something missing. I said, what's missing? She says, well, you got this chapter on prayer. You learn how to pray as a Christian brother. Then you have the chapter on suffering. You talk about your daughter. But you brothers aren't supposed to be married. How did the daughter come in? I said, well, we got, I got married. She says, but you don't say it. I said, well, you don't have to. She said, oh, yes, you do. She said, I, want, I want at least a page telling me why you left religious life. I said, I don't want to do that. She said, I, Jeff, she said, you have to. So I went, I went to Bill. I said, Bill, what? He says, Jeff, he says, I've been trying to tell it to you. He says, you've got to put something in. Why did you leave uh, monastic or religious life? So I finally, so I wrote the page. I ran it by brothers that are good friends of mine. They're still in the brothers. And I said, is this, are you offended by this? And I explained. So they said, no, no, it's great. No, you know, run it. So I said, OK, that's, that's in the book. Yeah, yeah. I should send you a copy of the book. I just gave one to Maureen. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you a copy. I'll give, I'll give you my card. Yeah, please, I'll send you a copy of it. Uh, what's the legacy of all this? I mean, now that this is pretty much has been a, a sort of an alter ego of yours, and um, uh, you've given this presentation and, and probably could go on for 25 hours, and Chautauqua oh, could, is probably yeah. the worst place. I know, you the pressure of finishing at a time. And, uh, yeah. but. Here we are, we've got, got a little bit of a few moments um, as you sit back and say, yeah. what's Bonhoeffer mean to you, perhaps, and to you individually, and then maybe what's, what's the bigger meaning here? It's changed my life, you know, really. And, uh, and as far as teachers, when I, my students are, they, they get very excited about Bonhoeffer. And a lot of them are, are engaged in things that they wouldn't otherwise get engaged in. Uh, one student, uh, Larry Pagnon, uh, got her, in fact, I have two students who went to jail as peace activists. Another one that went down to uh, Fort Benning to protest against the um, School of Assassins, you know, that, uh, uh, and uh, that's all, they're influenced by Bonhoeffer. And uh, one went to jail for uh, Ann Bennis. I tried to talk her out of it. I, she said she won't. She showed me her income tax form. I said, I said Ann, you can't send that in. She says, I refuse to put any money toward the military. I says, Ann, you're going to get arrested. She says, why don't you just pay the stuff? And her father is a wealthy oil, it was his oil company up in Philadelphia. I'm thinking, and she, and she's estranged from the father, and he wouldn't have anything to do with her. He wouldn't even pay her bail. And she was pregnant. Besides, she had gotten married to Bill, who's another one, who went to jail, but he's, then he got out. They took turns going to jail. So. I said, and you can't do it. I said, he said, no, I'm going to, I, I stick by my guns. And I said, okay, all right, I admire you, but I said, I don't think it's, then she realized when she got to jail, she was pregnant, and she felt that the jailhouse swill would not be good for the baby. So she finally caved and paid her taxes and got right with the government. I never told her, I told you so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Larry Pagnon was arrested. He, he was one of those that, floated the um, banner 
f uh, on General Electric building in, uh, outside Philadelphia. Yep, yep, yep. And he got arrested for um, peace, peace activism. And uh, he's a, I mean, he's a, I guess a black belt karate. I didn't know that. He's, he's working in a, he has an um, AIDS hospice up in New York. And that's all, you know, that's part of the legacy of Bonhoeffer. He feels he's got the energy, the money, and uh, he's willing to do something, something that helps the poor. Right. You know, the, the statements of Bonhoeffer and the poor are extraordinary. You know, even in the ethics, you know, that, you know, that statement I read, it's uh, just proud, it's almost out of the blue. It's, I mean, he says, you know, that he's trying to make the point of the uh, conspiracy, but also, why, why are they, why was Hitler so popular? Because the poor were um, left adrift, and Hitler just moved right into the gap. Uh, so Larry, uh, when I was moving, we had a big box in the basement. We had to move out of, because my daughter was falling all the time. We didn't know she had a brain tumor. And we had to move to a place that had a backyard where she could walk and get, uh, we thought orthopedic surgery or therapy. And uh, we thought it was something wrong with the legs. She was falling, but it was really a brain tumor causing her to fall. But they had this huge wooden crate, you know, it had been filled with something. And the people that were buying our house said, that's got to get out. You know, we want that out of the house. So there were two lawyers at, at the house, nicest people going. I mean, they were so congenial. <laughs> Believe it or not, they really were. <laughs> but they wanted that crate out of there because they didn't have a, they, they didn't have to do it. They had plans for the basement. They're going to remodel the basement. Good luck. So uh, I'm there. <coughs> Larry came over and said, "Can I help you out?" Yeah, I said, "Grab a saw." So we're sawing the thing up. He said, "Jeff." He says. That's going to take all day. I said, I know. I said, I hope you don't mind. He said, wait a minute, Jeff. Put the saws down. With his bare hands, he took the whole thing apart. No kidding. The whole thing apart. I mean, really. I said, I said, I said Larry. I said, this is a side of you I never met. Yeah. He said, yeah, I'm glad you never did. He said, <laughs> he said, I'll tell you, Jeff. He said, when I get arrested, he says, sometimes the police will poke you and punch you. He says, they sneak punches at you. He said, it's all I can do not to really hit them back. Yeah. He says, I said, well, Larry, your hands are deadly weapons. <laughs> but he's, a, you know, actually he's a very <laughs> gentle, <laughs> except for that, he's a very gentle person, but he's in for strongly influenced by Bonhoeffer. We, he writes every Christmas, sends donations for our Susan's uh, therapy, especially now that the governor is cutting Medicaid. Jeez, evil people. So uh, anyway, that, the repercussions on people, it's uh, hard to predict because there's so many that uh, read his life story or have seen the documentary film right. and uh, they're inspired. There's something about him. I mean, if he had stayed in America and died in his bed, the fact that he died, right. same for Martin Luther King too, the fact he was assassinated mm -hmm. makes all the difference. Now it's almost uh, Oscar Romero, <laughs> another a bookworm, but uh, the martyrs of the 20th century, and incidentally, you know, when Westminster Abbey decided to fill those vacant, what, 10 niches uh, with ma martyrs of the 20th century, it's interesting the ones they picked out. Oscar Romero, Martin Luther King, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and um, the Franciscan who starved himself to death, replacing a yeah, yeah, prisoner yeah, with yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, there are t ten of them, and you know it's, it's 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 a very inspiring story. If there's one book that Bonhoeffer wrote that there's been compiled on his words, what, what would you recommend to somebody? So the guy who comes in off the spaceship and say, "Here, you need to know about Dietrich Bonhoeffer," what would you give him? Discipleship. Yeah. Discipleship, and I, because I'm one of the editors. My co-author is dead now. Dead, that the co-editor is John Godsey, beautiful person, died last year of a stroke. Uh, it would be discipleship, but you'd still need some explanation there. You need, to, you need the life story. The life story is inspiring. Mm -hmm. Now, the biography is this thick. You know, I mean, it's a little thicker than that book. You know, you can't give the biography and say, here, there are shorter versions of it. A Testament to Freedom. My other book is very thin. Uh, 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 Liberating Faith, Bonhoeffer's Message, for that's a thin book. And now the book Reading Bonhoeffer, that's thin too. That's, I don't think they sell many copies of it, but there it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
This has been outstanding. I know you must be tired after getting prepared. Oh, I get to energize. <laughs> I can see this, and I love your passion. Um, it just kind of jumps out. Yeah, it's a, it's inspired. It's an inspiration. Yeah, I have to say that. Have you been to Chautauqua before? Never. Never. So great. But people are telling me, oh, you you'll love it. You'll love it there. Yeah. So it's. I'd love to come back. Joan is in love with the with everything. Yeah, yeah. And Tony Capolo. Oh, Joan, <laughs> she's in love with him. Yeah. yeah. But and I did want to ask you about the. You know, I am so disturbed at this Supreme Court. Yeah. Sure. And uh, and your man, Robert Jackson, is a shining example of what a Supreme Court justice should be. Mm -hmm. And said, what do we get? These, uh, they're, they're they're they don't make any pretense to hide their political affiliations. <laughs> or their uh, attitude towards the poor and the, uh, uh, the uh, individuals. And, and, and they're voted in, and in the Catholic Church, they praise them? I said, oh my gosh, they, they deserve to be confronted by the bishops. <clears throat> Alito, I, I was glad that uh, President Obama actually uh, <clears throat> denounced them once from his State of the Union, and I watched the lips of Samuel Alito saying, not true. Yeah. And it was true. <laughs> no, I think, I think we're really in trouble from many sides. I think the uh, <clears throat> extremism of the Republican governors and the Republican politicians, and I think the Supreme Court is really needs to be, how do you challenge them? They're in for life. Yeah. I mean, you've got a president will get appointees, right. but Alito looks, uh, you can, Pray for an early death or something, but <laughs> and then Thomas, who should be impeached for his uh, and Alito too. The uh, I mean, they're open to espousal of uh, causes and willing to speak, yeah. be uh, courted by the Koch brothers. I never met a more evil duo in our country than those two. Mm -hmm. Big oil, and they use it for evil purposes. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think you'll enjoy reading that, and that, that's a, a book which was put out by an author who works with the Highlights magazine, so it's oh, for young okay. readers. That's good. It's young readers, so it's, uh, it's, it's an easy read, and it gives you a good overview of Justice Jackson. Uh, a guy who never went to college, never graduated from law school, read and, the law. And yet he shined at Nuremberg. Absolutely. You know. What, what is it? It's common sense, or... Well, that's part of the wonderful story of Robert uh, Jackson. Gee. He read, he was a voracious reader, he wrote extremely well, mm. uh, just a self-taught guy. And mm. then, of course, Nuremberg was, uh, for my purposes and our purposes, we just had a week last week on Nuremberg and the Holocaust. Mm. We had a lot of uh, scholars, and we had a couple people who were at the Nuremberg trial who were as participants. Oh, no kidding, gee. And at their age, of course, you, you grab the moment. Yeah. Well, when I teach on uh, uh, the German resistance movement, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the German resistance movement is one of my uh, courses. And I, you know, I bring in the, uh, the Nuremberg trials. Yeah. So, and also the fact that the Nazis were so uh, evil, they knew they were losing, so they began to plan their escape, to escape judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, that they had a, a, a network of, and, and I think the Vatican was an unwitting helper. You know, they had these, uh, they were German, they were Catholic in name only, but the Catholic, they would be able to be helped along and finally get into a, a boat that would take them to a safe, in, a safe haven in uh, Latin America. It's amazing. No question, and that, that's, a, that's a whole intrigue unto itself. We had the number two prosecutor of Adolf Eichmann here at the Jackson Center. Oh, no kidding. A couple oh. of uh, years ago, and that was outstanding. Oh, yeah. And we had uh, number two guy at, with Jackson, Whitney Harris, just to have those opportunities of talking firsthand, like I'm talking with you, uh, to uh, uh, just to know what it was like to, to eyeball the Nazis. I mean, you don't really have that experience. It's hard, hard to believe uh, when you see them in that in the docket. Um, some of them look uh, pathetic. Mm -hmm. Some look uh, confused. Gehring looks arrogant. Mm -hmm. That would be in keeping. Yeah. Uh, Spear looked um, normal. Mm -hmm. uh, at least he admitted his guilt. Uh, and then some of the in court. Oh, jeez. Piece of work. 
you know. And Stryker, of course, just Stryker. Oh my God, yeah. There's a leading Jew baiter. God. Yeah. And then, the, you, know, you, felt, you know, you felt, where are the empty places? You know, those that should be up there. Yeah. Dr. Mengele. By the way, they trace Mengele. <laughs> uh, when you get that book there, Manfred Ritter wrote letters to Mengele. This, I read this now. This is, my, oh, my, hist my history memory is still good. And that's how they were, they intercepted his letters and found out that he was in Bolivia. Okay. So that alerted, now of course the Mossad was, you have to say, I think they admitted it too, they're a bit sluggish. <clears throat> I think they were so filled with the thought of, uh, they got Eichmann, that uh, they weren't as careful in uh, nabbing Mengele, who was you know, the so-called angel of death, oh God. And he, he obviously he did drown. Mm -hmm. You know, they, had some, they have some proof of that. <clears throat> but the, net, the network that allowed them to escape justice, that's, we've never got the full story on that. Right no. and, uh, this has been great. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Oh, well, thank you. It's, I'm sorry. It's, I'm scattered still. <laughs> so, well, you're yeah. far from it. Man, I just love your passion. It's thank, you, thank you for this book. I'm going to devour this. Well, I'll give you my card. Uh, I oh, yes. I, stay in touch. Do you have yeah. a card?